Today we have uh, pr uh, Professor Paul Cherick from the Chemistry Department, who is the Edward S. Uh, Sanford Professor of Chemistry. I should have worn my glasses. Um, uh, professor Cherick is um, is sort of his work centers are a lot right now on issues regarding sustainable or green uh, catalysis. Um, and uh, in this process, he has earned a number of uh, awards, very prestigious awards, including uh, the Linus Pauling Medal in 2020. Uh, just recently this year, it was announced that he was uh, elected to be a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of uh, Science. And, um, and there's a number of others. Um, uh, Professor Cherick uh, got his uh, BS in chemistry from Virginia Tech and his PhD all, uh, from Caltech. Uh, went to Cornell uh, for a few years uh, before coming and joining us here in Princeton. And uh, we're excited to hear what I heard, and I hope it's true, is going to be a presentation with some uh, sort of uh, rosy outlooks, perhaps, in, in it. No? Come on. Well, you have to wait 29 minutes and find out. All right, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Does that thank count you. for my time, too? <laughs> no. You're going to do the lights. And I'm on. So thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's always fun to be able to speak in front of your, your colleagues around campus and de-silo academia a bit, which I think is an important thing to do. And uh, I need to thank the audience. You know, I'm up against a, a really challenging thing, which is there was a free lunch, and then you had to climb down a flight of stairs. <laughs> and so th and I always worry about saying that because I'm afraid somebody's going to go, wait a minute, there was a free lunch, and then run yeah. upstairs and, and leave. So, um, so thanks. And uh, so what I hope to do is maybe make you a little bit more aware of the chemistry that goes behind your daily life and then how uh, that will impact ultimately sustainability. And so the first thing I'm going to do is start with a quiz. So hopefully you're paying attention. And the, uh oh, I'm not advancing here. Okay. So how many elements on the periodic table will you interact with today? Now, if you've seen me speak before, you are not allowed to answer. I don't know if you have or not. Some of you, my wife's here, she has. But uh, 50. 50, thank you. 100. Oh, yeah. You know how many times I've asked that question? No one has ever given me the answer of 100. So I teach intro freshman chemistry this year, and in January, or whenever our first day of class was, I asked this question. And the undergrad settled on four, <laughs> which was great. I mean, some of the older people in the room may remember Earth, Wind, and Fire, right? So they were pretty, they were, you know, Princeton students are smart. <laughs> we know that. Um, so yeah, you know, that, that you, if we're on the Price is Right, you would lose. It's 80. You went over. Rarely does anybody go over. And so the, the related question that I will ask you is, do you think there are 80 abundant elements on Earth? And the answer, of course, is no. So this really tells you something about the way you live your life, and, and maybe we should look more carefully at the interactions uh, of everything around us and the chemistry behind it. And the first thing I, I tell you is that you carry a periodic table with you every day, and that periodic table is, I mean, some people like Satish probably have a real periodic table in his wallet because he's a... He's a, he's a true scholar and a man of good taste. But the rest of you have this cell phone and your mobile phone in your pocket. And chemists don't even know how many elements are actually in it because all the components come from different vendors. And, and so people have actually done experiments destructing phones and doing elemental analysis to find out how many are there. But what I'm going to tell you about today is catalysis, as was said in the introduction. And one of the things I don't think people think about is when you take a medicine, what is not the carbon footprint? That's very narrow. That's what organic chemists like to do, is focus on carbon. What is the elemental footprint of taking Lipitor? And that's something you probably don't think about very much. And so another related question to that is, what's the elemental footprint of just household items that you use? And it turns out that medicines, whoops, do not hit that button. Wow, OK. Um, medicines are going to use exotic metals on the periodic table, like rhodium and palladium, whereas household items are going to use Platinum, and I'll show you the chemistry behind that. And so recently, we were uh, contacted by the Gates Foundation. And I'm going to show you an important example of this. And so what my group does is we study catalysis and sustainable chemistry. And the question really is, is what does that mean? 
So some of you may realize that there are these 12 principles of green chemistry, and catalysis has been identified as a key driver of green chemistry. But we ask a different question, and that is, is catalysis as sustainable as it can be? And the answer to that question is no, and it will always be no, because we can always do better. We can always make a catalyst that's faster, from more earth abundant elements, more selective, et cetera. And so back to the Gates Foundation. So they contacted us about this molecule. So this molecule uh, is off patent now. It's lenacapvir, and it's used to treat HIV. And, and what Gates has identified is that there's a barrier to distributing this in the underdeveloped world because how the molecule is put together. And so what chemists often do is stitch halves, halves of molecules together to synthesize them. So this bond in blue comes from a, what's called a palladium cross-coupling reaction. So you join this carbon to that carbon and assemble the molecule. And the cost of that catalyst becomes prohibitively expensive. And so with this elemental discussion then, and your elemental footprint, then the next question you should ask yourself is where do these elements come from? Meaning geographically. And some of you in, in this uh, department, in this part of campus may, may know this stuff. But there's a, a great book you can read. It's called The One Device. And it's about the discovery of the iPhone. And what the discovery of the iPhone did is it reinvigorated the Bolivian tin market. And so Merchant, the author of the book, decides to do an experiment. And the experiment is, is to work one shift as a Bolivian tin miner. And what he discovers is that your life expectancy, if you're a Bolivian tin miner, is 40 years. And your shifts are often 12 hours with no food. And, and Merchant goes and tries to do this, and he makes it for a grand total of 20 minutes. So it tells you the conditions under which these elements are mined. We'll talk a little bit more about net zero, but you, you may know of this element, neodymium. It's used in magnets. About 500 kilograms of neodymium is used in one of these giant wind turbines. And so hopefully I've stimulated to, think, to get you to think about where does it come from. Well, it comes from a Mongolian pit mine, and uh, you can see some of the products, hydrofluoric acid, sulfuric acid, that come out of this process. So this needs to be accounted for when you're talking about sustainability. And so we're going to focus a lot more on the so-called precious metals, so metals like platinum and palladium. Uh, where platinum comes from is mostly South Africa, and so then this brings up another issue, and that is the ethics of the mining and how the workers are treated. And if you follow this at all, you, you know that labor strife is a major issue in the mining of platinum in South Africa. Amazingly, 50% of all the platinum that we mine is lost, and I'll show you where a lot of it's lost to. And all of it, and this is amazing, right? I think you know, even non-chemists uh, know platinum, right? All of it would easily ever mined in the history of, of human civilization would fit in this room, actually much, much smaller than that. So it's, it's quite remarkable how little of it uh, we actually pull out of the ground. So the question is, is what else is wrong with palladium and precious metals? And one, one way chemists are starting to think about, about this now, and I really like this, is we all know that the precious metals by definition are expensive, right? So palladium, as I told you, costs uh, around $5,000 a mole. But I think as we move forward, we're now starting to consider, and almost every major pharmaceutical company is now considering this, is what is what's called the global warming potential of a certain element on the periodic table? And what that takes into account is how much carbon dioxide is emitted in the process of mining the element, purifying the element, et cetera. Okay? And so it turns out for palladium, maybe this number doesn't mean much to you, but it's around 4,000 kilograms um, of CO2 per kilogram of the metal. Whereas if you now move up, and I'll show you a periodic table, I, I knew there was not going to be a periodic table in this room. <laughs> Tried to be nice, but you, you know, you've got to bring your own periodic table when you're a chemist sometimes. Um, so cobalt is, is much cheaper, obviously, and, and some of you may know some of the issues with cobalt. We can talk about that in the Q&A. But the, the global warming potential is much less. And then ultimately, when you go to iron, that, that really looks pretty good from an environmental point of view. And then when you look again, and, and the pharmaceutical industry in particular is really worried about this now, is where does palladium come from? Again, you can see very little comes from North America. A lot comes from South Africa and Russia. And this has changed the equation with price. So if you follow these markets, the price of palladium has gone up uh, considerably since the invasion of the Ukraine. And that's ultimately translated onto to cost of goods. And so the take home question, and we can talk about this later, is in thinking about these issues, you got to move beyond carbon footprint. It's, got, it's part of the equation, but you also need to talk about your elemental footprint and specifically of net zero as we start to move to electrification and, and wind turbines and solar panels and what elements are used in those devices. And it's not pretty. Okay, so uh, you might be sitting here thinking, you know, 
maybe you used to have a high opinion of chemists. <laughs> and now you think, why would a chemist use one of the least abundant elements on Earth as a catalyst? And of course, the answer is it works, right? And so the question is, is why does it work? And this is a little bit of a chemistry lesson for you. And the chemistry lesson is, is it's how electrons flow with these various elements. So for a precious metal like rhodium, electrons tend to move two at a time. And so that's why you make jewelry out of things like gold, platinum, and palladium. It doesn't oxidize, it doesn't rust. Whereas when you go to the first row, like cobalt or iron, you get these one electron, uh, electron changes, and so then you get rusting. And so there's a fundamental challenge in our work, and that is how do you get a metal that likes to do this to do that and not do this? And then we got smart. And we got smart. After years of trying to suppress that reactivity, we said, wait a minute. What if we actually embrace it? Maybe we can do new chemistry that these metals don't do. And so there's our periodic table. And so catalysis, especially as applied to the synthesis of organic molecules, drug molecules, and household items, has largely focused on these six elements as the catalyst for these transformations. Nobel Prizes have been awarded for these reactions. A reaction known as olefin-metathesis in 2007, hydrogenations in 2000, and, and so on. And so what we're trying to do is to get chemists to look at a periodic table a little bit differently. And when they think of catalysis, not to think of these elements because of the reasons I told you, but in fact to think about reaching for those. And so how do you do that? And so I'll give you a few examples of this uh, for the rest of the lecture. And so uh, where we first really got introduced to this was by a, a colleague and a friend of ours um, now, um, and a collaborator at Momentum Performance Materials, Ken Lewis. And Ken likes to, to tell people this following quote, and that is, chances are that everyone who's listening to me right now has used the product of this following chemical reaction I'm going to show you in the last 24 hours. The product is in your clothes, it's, and you'll see some other places as well. Usually the cushions, but you don't have cushions here. Maybe the new building, they'll give you cushions um, <laughs> instead of the wooden seats. But here's a, here's a great example of this. So what you do is you add uh, a silicon to the end of a hydrocarbon chain. And what that does is effectively makes a surfactant molecule. And the silicone chemists call this an adjuvant. And what uh, it's used for is in spreading of herbicides. So these are the same volume of herbicide. And so you can imagine if you didn't add the silicone to it, you would have to add a lot more of the herbicide to cover the leaf. If you add just about 1% of this molecule into this product, it spreads out nicely. You use a lot less herbicide, a lot less ends up in the groundwater. <laughs> Momentum, prior to 2020, referred to these chemical agents as super spreaders. I don't know if their marketing division is now changing that because uh, that term has been uh, come to mean something else in our, in our new world. But um, this is what a super spreader used to mean to someone who does silicone chemistry. So this is practiced on a large scale and has been going on for a long time. And so people think, well, this has got to be a really good industrial process. It turns out it's not. And the reason why is because what the platinum catalyst does is it moves that double bond over one position. And then you don't add a silicon to it. So you get about 30% of this in your mixture of that, and then you have to do a distillation. So that's a huge problem because that costs you energy and generates waste, obviously, because you're throwing away that molecule. So another example of these silicones that are in your everyday life is if you ever have a rubber tip spatula in your kitchen, it's not made out of rubber, it's made out of silicone. Uh, if you get a package or you go to a, an event and you have a hello, my name is uh, sticker on your chest, um, there's actually a lot of chemistry that goes into the idea of being able to peel that off of a backing of a label and stick it and get it to stick. That's all because of this thing called a silicone. And where, where it comes from is you, again, have a carbon-carbon double bond and you add an SIH across it. These are two polymers now. So what the platinum does is click these two things together and you get this gooey material. How would you get the platinum back out of that? You can't. So the catalyst is really good. You only use a part per million of it. But every time you peel a label off of an Amazon box, there's platinum in it. It's an infinitely small amount, but you guys know how much you know, labels there are on the planet, right? So we're slow. So think about this from a sustainability point of view. And I think a lot of people don't think of this when they think about sustainability. We go to a far off place. There's labor strife. You spend 7,000 kilograms of CO2 to dig up you know, one ounce of platinum, and then you slowly just distribute that all across the planet again, never to be seen again. 
That, that doesn't sound very good from a sustainability point of view. Okay, so the question is, can you do this with iron? And so uh, we did this some, some time ago now. And what we discovered is that iron catalysts, you don't need to worry about the details here, um, do this reaction. And importantly, what the iron catalyst does is it doesn't create that byproduct. So the iron is not only replacing the platinum, but now it's actually doing something that platinum wouldn't do. And that's when chemistry gets really exciting to, to people who study catalysis. This molecule here is used to make low rolling resistant tires. So it saves you 5% on your gas mileage. And so what the iron catalyst will do is selectively put a silicon on that double bond and leave those other two untouched. Platinum won't do that. And so then uh, we went ahead and made that stuff that goes into the uh, envelope. You have a decent projector here. What you can see is the stuff that we made with iron is actually a little yellow. And the people that buy envelope goo don't want yellow goo, shocking. And so we spent a lot of time trying to get the color out of it. And so what you do, and this shows you uh, amounts of catalysts. So we can now do this with cobalt. And you can see when you have a little bit of catalyst, you don't see uh, any of the catalyst in the material. And then we went ahead and did this with uh, nickel and then found out that you can get this pristine uh, stuff. And what's shown here at the bottom is now how much per kilogram of product there is per catalyst used. So we're down to about 30 cents, whereas platinum is like $1.50, depending on the current price of platinum. So a second case study in this is, a this is going to sound like a mouthful, asymmetric hydrogenation. What is that? Molecules can be handed. So some of you may know the thalidomide story, where, where there were birth defects caused from uh, both hands of a molecule being given to, to pregnant women. And so, so when you have these handed molecules, it's on you, the chemist, to make only one hand, because that, that has potentially a different biological function from the other hand. And so I want to get you right to the front line. So this molecule is uh, just past phase three clinical trials. It was developed by a, a startup company named Biohaven and it's recently been acquired by Pfizer. This molecule is amazing. It's called Zajivapant. And if you're a sufferer from migraines, what you'll be able to do with this is put it up your nose. You'll be able to spray it up your nose and you'll get almost instant relief from a migraine. If you've ever known a migraine sufferer, you play this game of taking a pill. Should I take the pill, should I not? And then you wait for the pill to, to you know, function. So this molecule, uh, people think, is going to be game-changing. And there's a handed part of the molecule right here. And so we were asked by Biohaven and now Pfizer to figure out a way to, to make only one hand of the molecule. And so rhodium catalysis has been recognized with a Nobel Prize. And what you find out is that rhodium won't tolerate this ring here. And so what the chemist did to discover this molecule is actually how to put the rhodium synthesis back earlier in the sequence of events. And then what you're doing is you're carrying along a very expensive, resolved, chirally resolved material in subsequent synthesis. And that's not what you want to do, in addition to using rhodium. And so what we've discovered in collaboration with Merck up in Rahway is that you can use now cobalt catalysts to do this kind of reaction. And we've synthesized a lot of blockbuster pharmaceuticals that were previously synthesized using, using rhodium. So levatir acetam is a treatment for epilepsy. Naproxen, you probably all use that. That's a leave. It's a pain medication. So we can synthesize that now with cobalt instead of, in that case, it was ruthenium that was used industrially. And then now returning to this molecule, Zajivapant, we now have a cobalt catalyst that will do something that rhodium would never do. So we now can tolerate that unusual ring and then deliver the product. And this is now being carried out on multi-gram, even kilogram scale now in the Netherlands at a place called Samaris, where they um, scale these kinds of reactions to deliver the molecule to, to, uh, for the rest of the synthesis. And so we can play games now. And this is some chemistry stuff. So you don't really need it. If you're not a chemist, nobody's perfect. Um, you know, you can just humor me for a minute. So what we can do is we can change the oxidation state. So in the beginning, I showed you those catalysts were neutral. And if you remember your chemistry, those were cobalt-2. These are now cobalt-1. So you can't do this with rhodium. So we can change. The, the oxidation state of the catalyst by one electron. And this has been used now to synthesize a, a piece of citagliptin that's going to be used generically. Citagliptin is a molecule you take if you have type 2 diabetes. And then we can also show that a, a, a related but yet different catalyst also works in that jejivapant synthesis. So this is a, a fun way now to show flexibility and things you can do with these earth abundant metals that you couldn't do with first row metals. And so Dave McMillan tells me, our, our, our friend, colleague, and Nobel Prize winner, always show your work in bar graphs. <laughs> so things turned out OK for Dave. So I'll listen to, uh, 
listen to his advice. And so uh, a colleague, this is not us, uh, published a review. And what's cool is that in these hydrogenation reactions now, people are looking to cobalt more than they are looking to rhodium to do these reactions. So this is the impact of some of this work, which is really cool. Okay, so I'm gonna finish up talking about one last topic, and uh, hopefully this won't get me thrown out of here. Uh, maybe I wanna go back to work, so maybe getting thrown out wouldn't be the worst thing. But um, the challenge here is to live your life for 24 hours without using a product of fossil fuels. It's hard. So forget about ordering anything from Amazon, driving your car, you know that. Heating and lighting, you know that. Heating, turns out ammonia is synthesized from hydrogen that comes from steam reforming of methane or coal. You can't eat. But what I wanna to talk to you about more is the materials that are around you. So most people, Greta Thunberg in particular, doesn't seem to appreciate that you are wearing a barrel of oil right now. And, and it's really frustrating to me, the chemist, when people say, oh, we gotta live without these things, right? So if you're wearing a fleece sweater, you shouldn't. This is made out of polyethylene terthalate. That E is ethylene. And I'm gonna show you where that molecule comes from. The reason why you shouldn't wear these things is that this is a, maybe Satish can correct me on this, but when you wash this, little be bits of it go into your wastewater and end up in, in, in the ocean. So it's a great source of ocean plastic. You would have to uh, chop down every tree on the planet if you didn't use polyvinyl chloride. This is a molecule that's now in the news because this train derailment had vinyl chloride, the precursor to it, um, if you didn't make window frames out of polyvinyl chloride. Okay, so there's a, a trade-off you, I think, don't want to make. And these other materials are really remarkable. So this is polyethylene. So polyethylene is infamous because of the plastic bag, especially in a place like New Jersey. But as a chemist, this is truly remarkable. You can polymerize one molecule, ethylene, and make it a hard plastic that goes into your hip joint and it'll be there for the rest of your life and will withstand you know, all the bio biology that happens in your hip. Or you can process it in a different way and make a bag that's here used in, you know, for an IV uh, delivery. So this is really remarkable. And so I show this slide a lot, and this comes from Kim Raygard in, in, in the Netherlands, and this is really important. So if you want to ban plastic, the question I'm going to ask you is, is what are you going to replace it with? All the stuff around you that's made out of plastic. And so if you do that, you're pretty much left with metal, glass, and paper. And what this plot shows you is that those alternatives are worse than plastic in three important metrics. The amount of it, the mass, so you're going to generate a lot more waste, the amount of energy you're going to use to make it, and then ultimately the carbon dioxide that comes off of it. So I don't understand anybody who claims to be a scientist who can look at this plot and not conclude you should use more plastic instead of less. Because I don't know how to replace it. Okay? And so the question is, is that we shouldn't ban plastic, we should actually use more of it, but we need to make better plastics. And the question is, is what does that mean? And so how our economy works with carbon, we're talking about materials now, are from what I call the big six hydrocarbons. So these six molecules get used and enchained in all different ways to make these materials around you. And two of them you know of really well, ethylene and propylene. That's polyethylene, polypropylene. So your yogurt cup comes from propylene. The bumper of your car comes from propylene. Really amazing stuff. And so as we transition into the future, I argue that we need a new hydrocarbon age, and that is we need to maybe transfer to responsible, and that we can discuss what that means, bio-based feedstocks. None of these materials that I'm saying are so great were designed for end of life. People didn't think about how to throw them away. Okay, so that's what we need to do now. And then at the end, if I have time, I have no idea how I'm doing time, um, talk about sustainable aviation fuel. So what we discovered in our lab is that our iron catalyst will do something that, that no one had seen before, and that is, It'll take two of these big six molecules, click them together to make a new molecule that no one had ever made before. And we call it vinyl cyclobutane. So it's got this ring in it and then a double bond in it. Just to show you what chemists worry about, this is a nice liquid. Not everything works the way you want it every time. So <laughs> when an experiment goes wrong, you get a, a gunk. So if you're working with a major chemical company and they're doing it in a swimming pool and they don't do it right and they get that, you, you lose your friends pretty quickly because someone has to go in with a, a jackhammer and start you know, chiseling it out. So you don't want your catalyst to do that. So we stop that and so what you can do is you can polymerize this and make an alternative to polypropylene. And so we call this uh, polyVCB. And what's cool about it is, is it 
looks a lot like polypropylene, but it has a much higher melting temperature. And so what that means is you can start using it in higher temperature applications. You can put it in your microwave. You can put it under the hood of your car. So maybe your car becomes more lightweight and gets better, better, better gas mileage, if I can say that. So what about recycling? And I'll finish up because I don't want to go on too long. So this is an energy diagram of how polymerization works. So you take high energy molecules, vinyl chloride, which we're hearing about in Palestine, East Palestine, ethylene. We add a catalyst to them, you overcome the energy barrier, and then you end up with something that's quite stable thermodynamically. That's why these materials are so great, right? Because they're stable. So that presents a problem when you want to get rid of them, because now if you want to take this back and maybe convert it back to the molecules you made it from, you've got to climb up this hill, and that just becomes energetically unfavorable. And so what people are trying to do is pyrolyze these molecules, which means heat the heck out of them. So 350 degrees, and then you can start to get unselective chemistry and make waxes and gases and all kinds of stuff. Okay, so that's what we're thinking about doing, because we now have all this stuff spread all over the globe. And there's some other methods that have come out now that try to selectively take it back to where it came from. And so what we've been working on is this idea of a chemically recyclable polyolefin. So, so what the idea is, is to make a plastic that's energetically on par with the molecules that you started with. And some other people have thought about this too. And even if you're not a chemist, hopefully you recognize these molecules don't look like this one. So these are not the big six. Okay, so these are niche materials, not commodities. And so what we discovered back right before the pandemic was how to make this chain of squares. And it, we call this, Rick Register actually coined this term, DVOCB. So this is a new plastic, and what it does, it has this kind of sign curve to it. So it's a new material made from butadiene for the first time in, in 100 years. And what's cool about it is, is you can take it and re-expose it to the iron catalyst and use something called Le Chatelier's principle and get the monomer back. So this is a chemically recyclable polyolefin. So now what's on us, and people like Satish, is to figure out if this is good for anything. And that's what we're working on right now. And so this is a brief history of uh, butadiene polymerization. So you use this, these molecules all the time. They're in the uh, soccer cleats or golf balls or rubber tubing in your lab. It all comes from linear polybutadiene. It comes from this fun-loving guy <laughs> right here, Sergey Lebedev. He doesn't look very happy. Um, and then there's Megan. She discovered this back in, in 2019, 2020. And this is the first new microstructure of this uh, material in, in 100 years. So this is really, was really exciting for us. So what I want to do, and so uh, we're working on this now, and so we're trying to figure out, can you um, recycle it if it's in a mixture of other plastics? So one of my students, Cherish Nye, went to Nassau Street and went on a shopping spree and bought a bunch of plastic and then mixed her plastic in there and then showed that you could still chemically recycle it. So what I want to talk about just for five minutes, because I think this is important, is aviation fuel. We all love to fly. And what's going to happen over the next 30 years, there's a rising middle class around the world, particularly in China and India, and they're going to love to fly too. And so it's estimated that we're going to start using 800 billion liters of jet fuel annually by 2050. Okay? And you can talk about batteries and, and hydrogen maybe, but to put that in a 787 and think you're going to fly from Newark to Tokyo, it's just you don't have the energy density. So you're going to need good old-fashioned chemical fuel to do that. And most chemists don't know what uh, is in aviation fuel, and so this is what it is. It's a mixture of hydrocarbons that of all different shapes and, and sizes. And so what we're interested in are these molecules called cyclic alkanes. So these are molecules in rings. And the reason why we're interested in them is twofold. Is one, you can make it from biosources, and they also have really high energy density. So you get more bang for your buck when you burn them. And so what the idea is, is can you try to make molecules that look like that in a carbon neutral way? And so what's exciting is, is that there are now biochemical methods to do this. So you can make ethylene from sugarcane. A company called Brasschem does that. You can also make butadiene from, from sugarcane as well. But we've teamed up with a, a company in Salt Lake City that has this uh, bio process where you can take sugar and ultimately convert it to a molecule called isoprene. And what's cool about it is when you make this, you don't need to do a distillation. It just comes bubbling out of the uh, reaction medium. Now, whenever you talk about biocatalysis, you have to be mindful of land and water and all of that kind of stuff. And so we're not, I'm not going to talk about that now, but I just want to recognize that that is absolutely true. And so once this molecule is available to us now, we can do uh, an iron catalyzed reaction to make a ring out of it. So it makes this eight-membered ring. And uh, that's our catalyst made on gigantic scale. And there's some other examples of this cyclization reaction. 
And so what you do to make the fuel, and this is now came out of a biocatalysis group at the University of California, Berkeley, and what they showed is they could do a hydrogenation, and this is ultimately the fuel. And they used an evil platinum catalyst to do that. And so we've done that now with, with nickel. So that's really good. And so what we want to do is learn how to do the cycloaddition and the hydrogenation all with iron. But at the end of the day, what matters is, is how good is this molecule as a fuel? And what we're learning is, is, so this is a standard barrel of jet fuel, and this is the energy density, both in terms of volume and in terms of moles, if you want to think of it that way. And what our new molecule does is it has superior properties. So that, that's the fun part of chemistry, right? So you can start thinking about doing the sustainable solution, and then you ultimately make a molecule that might be better than what's used that comes from fossil. Okay, so with that, I'll stop because I'm, I'm out of time. And I'll just conclude on this uh, hydrocarbon part, and that is hydrocarbons and, and plastics are indispensable in our lives. We, we can't live without them, and, and I don't think we should even try. Um, but we should, what we should do is do new chemistry to try to think about doing this in a carbon sustainable way. I'll call it that. And so we've done that by, by making now new polyolefins that, that are chemically recycled, and we're trying to figure out what their properties are and what commercial applications they would have. Um, we've learned the properties of the catalysts that are used to make them. And then ultimately, we've now synthesized these new jet fuels that have superior fuel properties, but also come from biorenewable resources. So with that, I'll conclude. And I want to thank um, the people in my lab. Here's a picture of them currently. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I think we're going to answer questions seated. So I will, <laughs> I will take a seat. So thank you very much. I can. You don't want to be near me after that. <laughs> no, you, I, actually, I love you, but, uh, uh, so the reason I have to sit is I'm going to take questions from Zoom, from Zoom. and pass them on. Uh, all right. So I am sitting down here, and uh, for those of you joining us on Zoom, uh, the questions will pop up in front of me, and I will relay them. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to start with a question from the audience, and as uh, we like to do, or we being me, um, I would request that the first question come from a student, um, and I can handle silence very well. So we can chat amongst ourselves. We could. <laughs> so, yeah, there we go. Ding on. Let's wait for the mic so that our uh, remote friends can hear the question. Uh, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, it's very exciting to see that we can actually make a uh, few from uh, uh, bio, par pro bio product. You mentioned that we can, uh, you have already tested that we can use the sugar to make of the uh, alternative for the aviation fuel, but uh, imagine a world that will we be able to grow enough uh, sugar or cane uh, to make that fuel to replace the you know, hundreds or millions of years of accumulation of the Right, so, so I went through that qu quickly at the end. So the, there are two different approaches to it. So one is the brass chem approach, which is to take sugar cane and then convert that to ethanol and then ultimately ethylene. And so when you talk to them, what, what they'll tell you as a, as a major chemical company is sustainable carbon, how you address that is gonna be very regional. So that may make sense in Brazil. And so you should do it in Brazil because you, you can grow sugar cane and you don't have to fertilize it. So it really is okay. And as long as you're not taking away people's food supply, then, then you're fine. What I showed you at the end to make the jet fuel comes from a biocatalytic process. So yeah, there's a question of where you get the sugar from, right? It, so the, the biocatalytic process actually works on a broader spectrum of, of sugars. They don't have to be you know, glucose, the ones that you eat. And so you can do a calculation and look and see how much biomass there is and then how much sugar you can get from it, and then ultimately how much jet fuel. You can't right now make all of it. You can't make the 800 billion gallons. But the question is, should you not make any? Right? And, and so I would argue you should make some, for sure. Yeah. OK, do we have? So question on, for me, just following up. Are you allowed to do that? I'm not allowed to do anything. <laughs> no. Um, uh, so, so what about? Um, are there uh, are the when, when you burn this this fuel, are there byproducts that come out of it that are uh, going to interact with the the mechanisms, the machinery, or yeah, or great, our atmosphere? That, that's a great question. Uh, so, 
Um, the early returns are, it looks to be cleaner than normal jet fuel in terms of what it burns. So one, the, the one thing that was on the, the slide that I didn't point out is um, a contrail, mm -hmm. so, uh, the, the white thing that you see behind an airplane. So it's the, the early studies suggest that a cyclic alkane is you reduce uh, what are called aromatics in, in your jet fuel. You, you reduce the number of these soot particles that you generate when you burn it. So, so the more non-aromatic you can put in your fuel, the better. Has this molecule been put in a real jet engine and flown anywhere? No. So this is all the data I show you comes from a controlled laboratory combustion, not in a 787. And I can tell you why that. I can't get anyone to make a million gallons of something. <laughs> so when someone says we need to scale up, we'll say, hey, we can give you 10 grams. And Lufthansa laughs at you when yeah. <laughs> you say that. Right? So you need someone to make hundreds of thousands of gallons. And that's, a, that's not an easy thing to solve. Stefan and then Dan. Wait, wait, wait for the mic. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that very nice presentation and very inspiring. Um, I have a question which comes back to the, your full life cycle, right, that we have to factor in. And you then went into sort of showing examples where you can improve on the process. So from a science perspective, I will be wondering, are there bounds? that we basically can calculate. And so no matter how efficient this or that would work, um, you know, that we could sort of have an idea, you know, at one take home here would be, oh, just pump, pump in more energy, uh, sorry, money into the chemistry department and they will solve all the problem, right? But you probably at some point run into energy problems. And do we know where these bounds are? Right, so, I mean, coming back to the, the, the fuel problem, right, it, it's a good question because biomass is not a very efficient uh, converter of solar energy. So you might better put up uh, solar panels and produce a, a different type of fuel. And so, yeah, my question is, yeah, do we have an approach to that? Or what would that have to look like? Right, so, so I think there's a, there's a couple of answers to that. So I, in the energy thing, I didn't know if you were asking about the first two areas that I talked about, the catalytic part. And, and there, I don't think there is, right? So you can make a catalyst that's more and more active and then reduce energy. There, there shouldn't be an obvious bound. There's other issues for um, translation. But in the energy space, I think one of the, the first things I want to get out there is, is that we've made an organic molecule that's actually very simple, right? It's, it's an eight-membered ring with two methyl groups on it. No organic chemist had a good way to make that molecule on scale. And so that had never been explored at all as a fuel. So I think one message I want to deliver to everybody is that's what chemistry needs to do, right? Just structure. Now the engineers come in and can give us a hard time about what's the most energetic way to make it. Yes, you might not want to make it all from bio, but maybe now I can tell somebody eventually, but this looks to me as a chemist 50, 100 years out, can you fix CO2 into isoprene? Because now we have a way to take isoprene into that new fuel. So that energy question is an absolute important one. And I would say there are bounds, but they also they move, I think, as chemistry moves, right? That, that you can always find a better process. I, I think there's even a more basic issue, and that is if the costs were right and the fuel's better, I mean, maybe even fossil-derived Dimethylcycloctane could be an, a part of, of jet fuel. But, but I, you know, the, the brass cam answer to this is, and I like that, is, is that there's not going to be the, the moonshot silver bullet answer. And you got to chisel away at this at every opportunity that you get. And I think you see this in your consumer products, right? Made from 10% recycled plastic. You know, Lufthansa is perfectly happy to have 10% of their fuel be biorenewable, right? And I think that's better than zero. And then we have another question over there, and then I have one on Zoom, so. Great. Um, so your talk reinforces the idea that we better not uh, generate too stagnant a way of thinking about where these different compounds can come from. But traditionally, when people think about fossil fuel use, to what degree, what, what proportion of it is used for synthetic purposes versus for energy generation? And how does that sort of structure how we talk about well that's should a, we be using you know how much fossil fuels that, do we need to use that's a great question no, number one it's a great question because i know the answer um so the right now um, chemists get 17 percent of a barrel of oil we get 17 percent 
to play with to make chemicals. The thinking is from major uh, chemical companies is that number is going to go up. So the chemists are going to get more of the oil because as we electrify cars and transportation, so we're going to have more hydrocarbons potentially to play with. I mean, maybe, you know, so, so uh, percentage wise, right? And I, I think as that happens, then we might need to think about making some other. I think just as a chemist, you want to, I, I'm a synthetic chemist. I like to make molecules. And I think that's what's fun is that you make a new molecule and you do something with it and go, whoa, we never saw that before. So we had. Uh, the calculation you were showing when uh, re uh, replacing the plastic with uh, no, glass, metal, or paper is actually more costly than keep using that plastic. Do they take into account uh, the negative effect of the plastic in the environment beside the CO2 emission, like the pollution, not the fact that plastic going to the ocean, threatening the wildlife? Uh, it's a, it's a simple calculation in terms of what's used and then how much CO2 is used to make it. So the picture can be different if it's, we take that, that, yeah. that, I mean, that cost into account. If you want to think account. about how it gets thrown away, but then you also have to, you know, the, the good news about metal and glass is the recycling rates are those are very high, more so than polyethylene, for sure. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have two questions on the chat that uh, actually go well together in a way, because one of them is on the short time scale and the other one is on a longer time scale. So Lauren Pincus asks, um, uh, that, uh, I'm going to try and edit this. Uh, you spoke a bit about uh, the benefits of, of some of these new plastics being their recy how recyclable they are, um, but uh, Lauren raises a concern um, that the pl recycling plastic is that they decrease in quality every time they're recycled. Is this still the case with your, your new materials that you were talking about? That, and, okay. and, and then on the, uh, well, you, well, answer that one quickly and yeah. then I'll get to the other so, one. So to be clear, and I don't think I highlighted this enough, so when you put your polyethylene out in your bin on the curb, that gets mechanically recycled. Uh -huh. So that means it's, it's a physical process. And that's when you get this degradation of polyethylene goes from its original value to 10%. What I'm talking about is chemical recycling. So the answer is no, because if you can do this in an energetically efficient way, I take the plastic back to the monomer that made it. Okay. So it's not a physical thing, it's a chemical thing. So it ideally goes back into the chemical plant, makes the starting material again, and that becomes the infinite loop of chemical recycling. So that's why chemical recycling is interesting from a materials point of view, but then the energy point of view then comes into play, right? So how do you collect it? How do you decompose it? So, so the grand vision for something like this that I think that would be really cool, and we're nowhere near this, was could you think about using a hydrocarbon plastic that's so strong, so durable, that you could actually use it as a building material? So then when you tear down uh, one of the res colleges, right, you take it back to a, a place, and then you get the monomer back, right? That would be the ideal thing, or a bridge or something, but we're, we're nowhere near that. Yeah. Okay. Now, on the, on the other uh, end of the time spectrum, um, uh, Miriam Waltz asks uh, that um, they believe that um, what you're saying about plastic fuel-based uh, material uh, and fuel-based uh, materials um, currently is true, but raises the issue that uh, can we actually ever think of something that comes from fossil based plastic as being um, sustainable since uh, the fossil um, Hydrocarbons took millions of years to process and sustain, you know, and so it's not really sustainable. Um, um, it raises the issue, how long it, would it take to, to sort of create some of these things uh, in, a, in a truly sustainable way? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so one short answer to that I would give is that if you do the calculation to say how much polyethylene, how much polypropylene have we made, polyolefins, we call them, since seven, for the last 70 years, and where are they now? That's sequestered carbon. So, so the argument I would make is that, the, it's a longer term answer, is that your local garbage dump and these waste streams are actually the new oil wells, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's CH2 is what you have. It's what was in the ground and it's not in the atmosphere. It's actually, you know, that your plastic bag is actually oil effectively. So if you can take that and chemically turn that back into usable chemicals, and that's what a lot of chemists are working on now, then you basically change your supply chain from, you know, three miles down to the waste that people are throwing into the garbage dump. Huh. 
all the same stuff. The problem is, is we, when you look at all the stuff you're wearing, all that plastic, none of it's transparent. It's all filled with fillers and dyes and all that other stuff. So you have to figure, that's a major problem for the, the chemist to get it back out again. Well, right. I mean, transparent clothes wouldn't be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are certain institutions that are okay with that. <laughs> thank, thank, you for, yeah, thank you for the chat and the insights. I'm stunned and really uh, appreciate your, your approach in looking at the, the value of recycling uh, plastic garbage. I would like, remind everybody, and I'm sure that most people here have heard that that's uh, one of the primary sources of platinum currently are dumps. Yeah. You're, you're just extended. Absolutely right. Thank you very much. All right, so as you, and, right, as you incinerate this stuff, the things that are left over are these metals. Absolutely. So we have another online question, and was that a hand up? Yeah, but okay, so I'll get this one. So Herb Simmons uh, asked if 17% of the barrel of oil is made into chemicals, can there ever be an economically viable oil exploration and refining industry if and when oil is no longer being burned for energy? That's a great question. And, and I don't know that I'm qualified to answer that because I'm not an economist. But as a chemist, what I'll say is, I don't know where all this other material is gonna come from. I mean, we make hundreds of millions of pounds of plastic a year from the byproducts of, of oil and fossil fuel development. If you shut that off, I don't know where all that material comes from. So you, you don't get ethylene, you get it from sugarcane, but we've already covered that you can't scale that to deal with all, all the usage that we, we have. So I, I, it seems like it's a major supply and demand issue to me. So is a 17 percent, is that because 17 percent of the oil is useful for chemists, or is it 17 percent that is not being used uh, to create fuel, right? I, On which right. end is it? Where, where is the 17 percent, and where does that move? I think, I, I don't think I'm qualified to answer okay. that. Okay. Um, what yeah. comes out of a refinery, and when, and how much goes to ethylene, and how much goes to naphtha, and... Yeah, that I'm not, uh, I think you need to ask a chemical engineer that. We had a question. Good, thank you. So you made a wonderful uh, um, examples of, of the benefits of, of your, uh, how you're manipulating molecules. And I guess I have a question about the fate of these uh, chem new chemicals in the environment. You know, you know, these are not natural compounds. Nature doesn't necessarily know what to do with them once they're out there. So there is a... And we've, we've seen this happen over and over and over again. And right now we've got these perfluorinated compounds that mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to deal with. So the question, I guess, is before you, re you generate the, this beautiful compound, it has a, a very particular use, but and that, the concept of looking to see what is it going to do uh, on the back end, on the fate, um, on the fate of things. Uh, and I, I wonder if you could comment on that. I, I think that's exactly... Right, and I, I had that as a bullet on the slide. This is what Gabe and I were talking about at lunch. I think this is in front of everybody, whether you're a chemist, an engineer, and that is end of life. I mean, anything should be given that scrutiny. So if I'm making a new molecule, that should be scrutinized. This is why Satish and I want to work together. As we're making new plastic, I want to know how quickly they go to microplastic or nanoplastic before they end up in the supermarket. But I would also say, if you're going to apply that criteria to my chemicals, that should be applied to a solar panel, or that should be applied to a windmill. And, and a huge environmental problem is what you do with those blades from the windmill. Those are, those are polymer composites, and they're expensive to transport, and you can't recycle them. You have to take a chainsaw, effectively, and chop them up, and they get landfilled. So I think any material that we make, any pro consumer product we make, we as a society, a scientific engineering community, have to ask that question. How do you get rid of it? And that's a really, really, really hard question to answer. And I, I was at a Green Chemistry Gordon conference this summer, and one of the speakers from the pharmaceutical industry came under fire because the people in the audience wanted the drug companies to start designing medicines that when you excrete them from your body just magically you know, dis just disappear and don't end up contaminating the water supply. That's a really hard problem, right? I mean. Discovering a medicine that's effective and safe just as you take it is a challenge enough, let alone as you've excreted, it doesn't impact you know, fish, fish populations. It doesn't mean you don't strive for it, but it's just these are really hard scientific problems. Do we have, so, I mean, it, 
has really end of life never been or until recently no but (laughs) no people do recycle right i mean metal glass i mean this is uh, my understanding from the princeton sustainability folks why you get water now in a metal can well yeah right and I, i had an interaction with somebody in that office and the answer they gave me is they switched from plastic and for those of you who've been around long enough, it went to like a milk carton, so you felt like you were in kindergarten again. And then it ultimately went to this metal can. And the reason why is the recycling rate for the metal can is the highest. So that is going to, that is an end of life yeah. issue, right? Somebody thought about how, at least somebody at Princeton thought about how to distribute water in a can. So, I mean, just thinking about, you know, junkyards, you see cars People stacked on top of each other. And, and so how many of the things in our lives are actually designed well for, for this end of life thing, other than a can and a bottle? I would answer that question like I answered about catalysis. Yeah. We can always do better, okay. right? I mean, I think that's the answer, is that you can make any process more efficient and better. Okay, are there any other questions? Because I, I, I just got the, the sign. Oh, five minutes remaining. <laughs> so, really, re- for those of you who couldn't see, there really was a sign. <laughs> there was. <laughs> there was. A, somebody held up a sign. It's a professional organization. <laughs> it's a professional organization. Over here. All right. Um, well, if um, there are no questions, what I'd like to do is uh, thank Paul again. This has been a uh, fantastic. I am actually was very encouraged by this because um, thinking about you know, the, the, the low abundance and the things that need to be done to get to many of these rare earth elements it has been something that really bothers me in thinking about a sustainable future. And so having our friends in chemistry uh, really taking this seriously is, is a really encouraging uh, turn of events. And, and, and so we need, to, we need to start walking across Washington more. Uh, <laughs> You're always and, uh, and so thank you uh, very much again. And then I would like to uh, invite you all to come back for another free lunch and a phenomenal talk. On April 4th, we will have our semester's third speaker, who will be uh, Paul Lewis, a professor of architecture, uh, who will be discussing building from plants, architecture, and embodied carbon. So look forward to seeing you in April.